It's demo time! The space I'm tackling today is my front entrance. It's a small 4x6 space that already has tile, and the sad thing is, I really do like this tile. What I don't like is how the tile was installed. It's kind of hard to see on camera, but there's nothing flat about this floor. It's all peaks and valleys like a wavy roller coaster. Not only is it hard to look at, but it's really uncomfortable under the feet. It's such an eyesore that most of the time we keep it covered up with this rug, even in the summer. So it's official, this tile has to go. So while I've done a bit of tiling before, I'm definitely no expert. Let's just say that the jobs that I have done before, the substrate was already already, it was brand new construction, and it was really easy to lay down new tiles. This job is going to be a little different. I'm going to have to do some demolition and prep the surface to lay down some new hexagon tiles that I got. All right, let's get started. Time for demolition. The first thing I needed to do was remove any obstacles, like this transition strip that came up easily with a pry bar. I was careful not to break it as I wanted to reuse it later. In most cases, you'll want to remove the baseboards and tile up to the wall, but in my case, I just removed the quarter round so I can keep my antique baseboards intact. For now, I moved my radiator flanges out of the way, but I'll find a replacement for these rusted rings later. All right, so I've gathered all the tools I think I'll need for demolition. I'm actually not going to use that giant sledgehammer that you saw because I don't want to damage my subfloor. So I'm going to start with a really small sledgehammer and a chisel and take it from there. I figured it would be easiest to start from the edge where I could get my chisel underneath the tile and try to pry it up. I used a small piece of wood to protect the adjacent hardwood floors from damage and hammered away to try and break the first row. I'll admit it was a slow process at first, probably because this was my first time doing this, but eventually it got more comfortable and started to make some headway. After I got things started, I thought that maybe I could get onto the tile with a crowbar and just pry them off, but that didn't work out for me. So back to the chisel I went. Eventually I could lay the chisel almost flat and get under the tile to rip up bigger sections. At this point, I figured I would try my hammer drill to see if I could use it like a demolition hammer and pop up the tiles, but this did not work at all. So this brings me to tip number one. If you're redoing a large space, consider renting a demolition hammer. It'll save you a lot of time and a lot of sore aching muscles too. So back to the hammer I went, this time pounding on the pry bar, which did help a bit I guess, until eventually I found the ultimate secret to easy manual tile removal. Which brings me to tip number two. Pound on the tile with a small sledgehammer to loosen up the old thin set and help loosen the tiles. After that, the tile started coming up in sheets, which made me really happy. At this point, I started to feel like a demolition pro and removing the rest of the tiles went much faster. Not to say I wasn't really sore the next day. After demolition, it was time to clean away all the debris and inspect the subfloor. I got pretty lucky as the tile came up pretty clean. There were only a few spots with mortar left on the plywood subfloor to clean off. I chiseled and scraped away all traces of mortar, then vacuumed the floor and inspected it to ensure the subfloor was clean and level before moving on. I had to add a thin 5mm sheet of plywood to raise up the floor just a bit so my tile would be at the same height as my hardwood floors. Now ideally you should use cement board for this, but I couldn't find any thin enough for my needs. A lot of people will say you can install tile and plywood, and while I've heard polarized opinions on this, all I can say is that my old tiles were directly on plywood for years, and I really struggled to get them off. That being said, I realized afterwards that I probably should have used an uncoupling membrane like a Schluter Dietra, which would have been thin enough for my needs and likely the optimal solution. So after securing the ply with a lot of narrow crown staples, I could start getting ready to lay my new tile. I wanted to leave a gap for my T-molding, so I temporarily nailed down a few strips of plywood to act as a spacer while I laid the tile. The most visible edge on this floor will be the transition to hardwood, so I wanted to ensure that I had a full tile here. I laid out a row of tiles, using my spacers to see what I'd end up with at the other end, and out of pure luck I ended up with a full tile, which means I won't have any tiny offcuts. I decided to do a full layout to see how the pattern would look and to make sure I wouldn't have any small offcuts on either side. 
This pattern was quite the brain teaser, so for tip number three, when working with patterns, take a picture that you can refer to later. This also brings me to tip number four, which is to plan your layout and pre-cut as many tiles as possible. And that's exactly what I'm going to do, starting with this front row. This is a fairly affordable sliding wet saw that I purchased on Amazon, and I'll leave the link down below. I started cutting a few tiles in half for the front row, taking it nice and slow, and letting the blade do the work. As you may have noticed, I'm using a wedge to help support the tile. And this brings me to tip number five. When cutting hexagon tiles, cut yourself two wedges. As you can see, when cutting in this direction, there's really no reference edge to put up against the back fence, so having a wedge helps support the piece as you push it through. The same applies when cutting in this direction. There's not much to support the back edge and it can easily move out a square, but using a wedge helps solve the problem. Just clamp it in place and test it to make sure the clamps don't get cut up on anything. Then making the cuts is a breeze. I know how stressful tiling can get with your thin set drying too fast and things going wrong. So here's tip number six. You can nail a ledger down to create sections and work one small section at a time. Here I'm doing another dry layout of this small section so I can see what cuts I need to make and so I can pre-cut all of my tiles. I don't want to be running to my tile saw while my glue is drying out on me. This time I'm using spacers so my measurements will be precise. Once I reached the last row, I could measure and cut the outer pieces and test the fit. It was hard to keep up with which piece went where, especially with the complex pattern. And this brings me to tip number seven. Trace out a grid and label your offcuts so you'll know exactly where they go. So with all my pieces cut and fitted, I'm now ready to start actually laying down tile. Oh, but if you're wondering how I cut that weird little piece around the radiator pipes, here it is. Pliers didn't work, but a little tap and the piece broke off clean. And getting this fit just right was so satisfying. Okay, so I started removing the tiles, but I needed to be really deliberate about it to avoid messing up the pattern. So here's tip number eight. When working with patterns, it helps to make one pile per row, making sure to maintain the orientation of the tiles as well. That way you can just grab them without thinking during installation. When it comes to mixing the thin set, experienced tilers will do this by eye and just intuitively know when the water and powder ratio is right. But that's not my case. Instead, I weigh the thin set and measure the water according to the package. I then use the paint mixer to mix the thin set for about five minutes. While I let it sit for the required 10 minutes, I laid out the tools I'll need that I picked up during my latest trip to Princess Auto. By the way, I'll leave a link to all the tools that I use in this project in the description down below, including this trowel. Once the thin set was ready, I started by plopping down a few clumps and spreading it out with the flat side of my trowel, trying to get an even coverage. I then used the notch side of the trowel to comb the thin set all in the same direction. From my limited experience, I know how important it is to get nice clean lines without clumps if you want to avoid messy squeeze out. And with that, I could just start grabbing the tiles from my first pile and drop them into place, moving them back and forth just a bit into the mortar, then insert the spacers and repeat for the next tile. Having the piles all laid out with the exact orientation makes this part way easier than trying to figure out the patterns as I go. It did happen that I put down a tile and wasn't sure anymore, but I just referred back to the picture I took earlier and could quickly carry on. You'll see me working with two different trowels, and that's tip number nine. Use a pointed trowel in combination with your notch trowel. It makes it so much easier to spread the thin set and clean off your other trowel, and just makes the job easier and much cleaner overall. After applying thin set to the entire section, laying the pre-cut tiles went really fast, and this is where all the prep work really pays off. You only have about 15 to 20 minutes to lay down your tiles after the thin set bed is made, so this is why I made sure to work in small sections and have all my tiles cut and ready to drop in place. And lastly, la pièce de résistance. So satisfying. All right, here's tip number 10 for you. Make sure to remove any unused thin set before it hardens. This will save you from a huge headache later. Now, because I'm working in sections, I let this first section dry for 24 hours so I could then walk on it the next day and lay my next section. The next day, I mixed up a new batch of thin set and applied it using my trowel. Using my system of piles, I dropped the tiles in place one by one, again moving them back and forth slightly in the bed of mortar to get a good adhesion. 
In case you're wondering about back buttering, from the research I've done, you don't need to back butter small to medium tiles like these, but it is recommended for large tiles. And that's tip number 11. Once I reached my temporary ledger, the space was a bit tight, so I simply removed it and filled the remaining section with thinset so I could finish laying the remaining tiles. Eventually I had to open the door and work from the outside, but that was all part of the plan. And this brings me to tip number 12. Don't back yourself into a corner. Always finish at the edge of a room or a doorway. I let the glue set up, but only for a few hours before removing the spacers. Any longer and they can become really hard to remove. At the same time, I gently scraped away any squeeze out using a utility knife. It's much easier to do this before it hardens too much. It's looking good already and I can't wait for the final result. I let it set for 24 hours, then got to work on the grout. Just as I had done for the thin set, I weighed my grout powder and added it to my bucket of clean water, which I had also carefully measured. I mixed up the grout for a few minutes and immediately got to work. Working one small section at a time, I first used a wet sponge to wipe down the tile, then dropped on a small amount of grout and started working it into the joints using a grout float. Typically you want to run the float diagonal to the joints, but since the joints in this tile run in all directions, I also ran my float randomly in all directions, back and forth, in order to force the grout into all the joints. I kept going section by section, filling all the joints. Once I was done with a section, I dragged the float along the tile and tried to remove as much excess grout as I could. It's not the end of the world if you leave a lot behind, which, as you'll see, was the case for me. It'll just mean more cleanup later on. I let the grout set for about 30 minutes and then came back with a clean bucket of water. I used a damp sponge to moisten the dried grout and gently massaged all of the joints. The goal of this first pass isn't really cleaning, but rather smoothing out the joints, checking that they're all filled and evened out. The tile wasn't fully clean after this first cleaning, but that's totally normal. I let it set up for another 15 to 20 minutes, then came back with another clean bucket of water. This time the goal was to clean off the excess grout. I first loosened the dry grout, then wiped it off using the clean side of the sponge. Then as they say, rinse and repeat. The tile was pretty clean when I was done, but again it wasn't perfect, which is to be expected. At this point I let the grout firm up for about 24 hours. The next day when I returned there was a haze on the tile which I had expected. I've read articles that suggest using a cheesecloth to remove the haze, but this got me nowhere. Instead, and here's tip number 15, I used a damp microfiber cloth to wipe off the haze and followed up with a dry microfiber cloth to buff it dry. This really worked well and got all the tiles nice and clean. All that was left were the finishing touches, like replacing the quarter rounds and the transition strip. And then as if on cue, Inspector Zozo showed up for a final inspection and she seemed to be quite satisfied with the outcome. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully you picked up a few tips from one DIYer to another. I'm so pleased with how this project turned out and especially relieved that I didn't mess up the pattern. I guess all that planning paid off in the end. Until next time, thanks for watching, see you soon.